Καλησπέρα σας. Καλώς ήρθατε σε αυτή την ειδική εκδήλωση του Φόρουμ των Δελφών για την Ελλάδα στη νέα εποχή. Σας καλωσορίζω εκ μέρου του Οικονομικού Φόρουμ των Δελφών και είναι ευκαιρία με αυτή την εκδήλωση να δούμε τι σημαίνει κάπως προβλέπω το μέλλον. Αν δούμε την ιστορία του ανθρώπου από τότε που υπάρχει οργανωμένη κοινωνία, θα δούμε την ανάγκη που έχει ο άνθρωπος να προβλέπει το μέλλον. Ακόμα και στον δικό μας τον εξελιγμένο αρχαίο ελληνικό πολιτισμό, είχαμε τους μίστες, τους ιερείς, είχαμε και το μαντίο των δελφών. Δεν νομίζω να είναι κανείς από εδώ που πιστεύει ότι το μαντίο των δελφών ήταν απλά μία ιέρια ή ιερείς, οι οποίοι μεθυσμένοι από αναθυμιάσεις έδιναν ακατανόητους χρησμούς. Νομίζω κάθε άλλο εκτός από αυτό. Έτσι κι αλλιώς οι έρευνες πλέον δείχνουν ότι ήταν ένα οργανωμένο σύστημα, το οποίο για να δώσει τους χρησμούς χρησιμοποιούσε το ένστικτο, είχε πολύ οξυμένη την έννοια της παρατήρησης, τη δύναμη της συγκέντρωσης και μέσα σε όλα αυτά πρόσθεται και τη σοφία της παράδοσης. Και με όλα αυτά προσπαθούσε να ερμηνεύσει τα μελούμενα. Πολύ αργότερα, η ανάπτυξη της επιστήμης ήρθε και πρόσθεσε στα παραπάνω τη δύναμη της λογικής και την ελευθερία της σκέψης. Και μέσω της επιστήμης, που βάλετε και σήμερα αρκετά, μέσω της επιστήμης έχουμε σήμερα πάρα πολλά διαθέσιμα εργαλεία. Έχουμε πολύ εξελιγμένα μαθηματικά. Έχουμε μια, στη διάθεσή μας μια τεράστια υπολογιστική δύναμη. Και ας μην ξεχνάμε και την αρχιοθετημένη γνώση, η οποία και αυτή πλέον είναι προσβάσιμη στους περισσότερους από εμά. Όλα αυτά μας επιτρέπουν να πούμε πως η μελέτη του μέλλοντος είναι κατά κάποιο τρόπο ευκολότερη και ίσως ακόμα και εφικτή. Σε αυτό το πλαίσιο είναι σημαντικό όπως έχουμε σήμερα μαζί μας τον επικεφαλή στρατηγικής ευφυΐας του Παγκόσμιου, Φόρουμ, του Παγκόσμιου Οικονομικού Φόρουμ. Εδώ πρέπει πάλι να αναρωτηθούμε τι θα πει στρατηγική ευφυΐα. Θα πει ότι υπάρχει μια ομάδα που επικεφαλή είναι ο Στέφαν και thank you Στέφαν for being here with us. Υπάρχει μια ομάδα που χρησιμοποιεί όλα τα διαθέσιμα εργαλεία που μας χαρίζει η επιστήμη και μαζί με αυτά κινητοποιεί το τεράστιο δίκτυο του Οικονομικού Φόρου. Ένα τεράστιο δίκτυο από εμπειρογνώμενες, από ακαδημαϊκούς και από εταιρείε. Αυτό το δίκτυο μαζί με τα διαθέσιμα εργαλεία ουσιαστικά φτιάχνει την ατζέντα του Παγκόσμιου Οικονομικού Φόρουμ. Και τι σημαίνει ατζέντα του Παγκόσμιου Οικονομικού Φόρουμ. Και αυτό πρέπει να κάτσουμε να το σκεφτούμε, γιατί δεν έχουμε επαναθυμηθούμε ότι η συζήτηση για την τέταρτη βιομηχανική επανάσταση, η οποία τώρα είναι στα στόματα όλων σχεδόν, ε, ξεκίνησε από το Παγκόσμιο Οικονομικό Φόρουμ. Ακόμα και αυτό που τώρα αρχίζουμε δειλά-δειλά να συζητάμε, ο περίφημο συμπεριληπτικό καπιταλισμό, το inclusive growth, και αυτό ήταν ένα κύριο θέμα του Παγκόσμιου Οικονομικού Φόρου. Και αν θυμάμαι καλά, στο τελευταίο που έγινε διαζώσει, μπήκε η συζήτηση για το κλίμα, για το climate. Σταματήσαμε να μιλάμε πλέον για το climate change και μιλάμε για το climate emergency ή ακόμα, ακόμα και για το climate crisis. Άρα, δεν μπορώ να σκεφτώ καλύτερο καλεσμένο για την εκδήλωση αυτή που είμαστε σήμερα, στην οποία ανακοινώνουμε και την ίδρυση του Κέντρου για το Μέλλον της Εργασίας, του Οικονομικού Φόρουμ Δελφών, όπου μέσα από αυτό το κέντρο θα χρησιμοποιήσουμε και εμείς το δίκτυο που έχουμε για ανταλλαγές γνώσεως, ανταλλαγές εμπειριών, πάνω στο πολύ καυτό αυτό θέμα του μέλλοντος της εργασίας. Σύντομα θα ανακοινώσουμε και μία πρωτοβουλία για τις ψηφιακέ δεξιότητες, και αυτό είναι ένα πολύ μεγάλο ζήτημα της χώρας μας αλλά και όλου του κόσμου, και δουλεύουμε και σύντομα θα ανακοινωθεί το Κέντρο για το Μέλλον της Υγείας. Συμπαραστάτης 
σε όλες αυτές τις πρωτοβουλίε του Φόρουμ των Δελφών είναι σημαντικοί φορείς και εταιρείε. Μία από αυτές τις εταιρείε είναι και η υποστηρικτής της σημερινής εκδήλωσης η Κουάλκο. Και αυτή πρέπει να την έχουμε στο α, στόχαστρό μας. Γιατί? Είναι μια ελληνική εταιρεία τεχνολογίας. Μια μεγάλη ελληνική εταιρεία τεχνολογίας. Η οποία είναι εξωστρεφής και εργάζεται αθόρυβα, αλλά πολύ σκληρά, για να μπορέσει η Ελλάδα να αντιμετωπίσει τις προκλήσεις του μέλλοντος, τις οποίες θα παρουσιάσουμε και θα συζητήσουμε. Τους ευχαριστώ πολύ και ευχαριστώ και προσωπικά τον κύριο Τσακαλώτο για τη στήριξή του. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω επίσης τον Αλεξάνδερ Χετζάτζη, ο οποίος είναι διευθυντής του Κέντρου Περιβαλλοντικής Πολιτικής στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Γενέβης. Τυχαίνει να είναι και λάτρης της Ελλάδας και της Αθήνας ειδικότερα, με τον οποίο έχουμε πολύ καλή σχέση και μας βοηθάει πολύ με τις ιδέες του και την ενέργειά του. Επίσης, κλείνοντας, θέλω να ευχαριστήσω τη Μαρίλη Μέξη. Είναι Senior Fellow στο Geneva Graduate Institute και επίσης Senior Fellow στο Ινστιτούτο για την Κοινωνική Ανάπτυξη των Ηνωμένων Εθνών και σύμβουλο της Προέδρου της Δημοκρατίας. Είναι επίσης, εδώ και μερικές ημέρες, η επιστημονική διευθύντρια του Κέντρου για τον Μέλλον Συνεργασία του Οικονομικού Φόρουμ Δελφών. Την ευχαριστώ και αυτή πολύ για τη συνεργασία. Τέλο, θέλω να ευχαριστήσω τον Στέφαν που ήρθε, δεν ξέρω πριν ή μετά το Όμικρον, στην Ελλάδα. Ταξίδεψε, έκανε τον κόπο να έρθει εδώ in person. Thank you very much, Στέφαν. Και όλου του ομιλητέ οι οποίοι θα συνομιλήσουν για πάνω στην έρευνα και για την επόμενη μέρα τη Ελλάδα. Σα ευχαριστώ όλου πάρα πολύ. Ευχαριστώ και εσά που είσαστε εδώ σήμερα και καλό στο βήμα την Μαρίλη Μέξη για να θέσει το πλαίσιο αυτής της κουβέντας. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ. Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Γιάννη, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την, για το, για το, για την εισαγωγή. Θα μιλήσω στα αγγλικά για να μπορέσω να δώσω έτσι Uh, την, uh, το βήμα στο πρώτο πάνελ το οποίο θα uh, διεξαχθεί στα αγγλικά. So, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us today. It's my great pleasure to uh, kick off our discussion and welcome in Athens a very good friend from Geneva, <laughs> Stefan Mergenhaller, Head of Strategic Intelligence of the World Economic Forum. Uh, thank you a lot, Stefan, for accepting our invitation to be here with us today. Um, just let me tell you that Geneva, where Stefan, Alexander, and I myself reside and live, uh, is the place of the uh, World Economic Forum and the United States Nations, and it's the center of global governance hosting more than 40 international organizations. And it's also the center of global conversations, especially in Europe. So our discussion today provides a chance to present global insights coming from this wider international Geneva landscape as a way of comprehending national trajectories and especially uh, the Greek one. Now, before I go into uh, more details about, uh, about the way we, uh, uh, we are thinking of this uh, uh, event today, I would like to extend my gratitude to Qualco and uh, to Mr. Orestes Tsakalotos personally for making this event possible, and to Olga Stamatskidaki, and also uh, on, on the part of the Delphi Economic Forum to Mr. Simeon Tsomokos and Mr. Yanis Somatos, Yanis, uh, for this excellent organization of the event. Now, this event is timely because it occurs at the close of one year and the start of another. And initially, we had anticipated that the so-called return to normal would begin by the end of 2021 but we are now entering into the third year of a global pandemic that practically seems 
unstoppable. Stefan will offer us a glimpse into the future trends very shortly, based on the uh, foresight exercises they do at the World Economic Forum. And to be frank, Mr. Tsomoko, Simeon, what a unique occasion to have this foresight insights presented in an event organized by the Dutch Economic Forum. A unique opportunity to show how the spirit of the Greek Delphi Oracle is still very much alive with us today, albeit in very different 21st century foresight forms. Now, before I go to Stefan, I would like to highlight what we have learned so far from the pandemic experience in Greece and globally, which I believe may serve as a basis for comprehending what to expect in the future. So I have identified four big lessons. Lesson first, what we have essentially learned is how fragile and how global healthcare issues have begun. The new Omicron variant drew our attention to Africa. And let, let me give you some stunning figures. Only nine African countries had met a target of vaccinating 10% of their populations against COVID by the end of this September, according to World Health data, the World Health Organization data. A statistics that illustrates how far the African continent is lagging behind global vaccination rates. A statistic that also illustrates global inequalities and the need for global vaccine equity. The pandemic has highlighted, therefore, how important it is for countries to share their knowledge serve their tools and resources with those who unfortunately are less equipped and to do it with a win-win version. Now, the second takeaway from the pandemic experience concerns the labor market. What we have seen is that work is everywhere now. Globally, organizations have been experimenting with new models of work. We have seen fully on-site and fully remote models and everything in between. We have seen also the talent market undergoing fundamental shift, moving from an age of abundance of talent to an age of scarcity of talent in many sectors and fields. The great attrition is happening. A record number of employees have or plan to quit, a trend disrupting businesses and labor markets everywhere. Now, for countries like Greece, there has also been the phenomenon of brain drain. And in addition to that, a skill mismatch. Jobs don't match the people. And the bad news is that as digital innovation accelerates, the record break in talent camp will only widen. So the talents in the post-COVID era is how we can transform the great, transition, the great attrition into the great attraction. To adjust to new conditions, we have seen that successful organizations are shifting their thinking towards the capability needed to win in their marketplace. In what ways? Through foresight, strategic modeling, or future workforce options. They clarify future roles, skills, and mindsets to deliver their strategy. Then they focus on sourcing and developing this through reskilling, upskilling, recruitment, or leveraging the big talent pool of the gig economy flexible workers. So a new labor market is emerging, and business would need to adapt accordingly. In this context, for governments, the policy implications are immense. There is a need to increase regulatory agility to respond to changing labor markets. With remote work and technology-enabled work, the notion of workplace safety is being redefined, and working conditions in virtual office environments acquire completely new meanings. And as the pace of digital transformation accelerates, and as the so-called telemigrants can now work off-site, but also for multiple employers, in different countries across the globe, it's becoming absolutely necessary to adapt 
our social protection systems and labor laws and make them fit to the realities of more flexible and globalized working lives. And along with the change in the labor market, there is another big lesson coming out of the uh, pandemic experience. We need to bridge economy and ecology. The pandemic has revealed the interlinkages between the environment and our livelihoods. Climate change is our next big challenge. Many countries are taking action, but progress is insufficient. Yet the methods are clear. We won't succeed without integrating environmental and social sustainability into governmental strategies and corporate governance. Let us see the facts. We are now encountering completely new situations. In the labor market, large numbers of employees say they would consider taking a pay cut to work at a company that aligns more with environmental and social governance goals. So preferences change. Concurrently, more and more young employees want to get behind a purpose, something other than profit. Clearly, the industrial era mindset of putting profit before people and planet is becoming obsolete. And the markets are adjusting to the new situation. Global sustainable investment now tops $30 trillion. Evidence is suggesting that global capital markets are about to witness a seismic shift of capital into products that promise to support environmental, social, and governance goals. Green capitalism, as I call it, is on its way. But it's important to see here that moving forward, the convergence between corporate sustainability and sustainable investing offers unprecedented opportunities to renew global markets from within. And it's here that governments, as well as the private sector in Greece and elsewhere, can make a difference. Greece, of course, cannot be left behind these changes. Now is the time to retire old dogmas and to give way to a fresh start. In the new era, we want Greece to have global presence, from universities to businesses, as a condition of prosperity and growth. And we want the Greek workforce to acquire the skills and mindsets needed for the 21st century globalized labor markets. So we need to invest more in skills and innovation, in digital and green technologies. And we need to align sustainability across policies and sectors and over time. And while we do so, we must continue to address the bottlenecks that are embedding Greece's growth, keeping in mind that certain forms only function in tandem with others. And finally, the biggest lesson we can draw from the pandemic experience is the need to be better uh, prepared for the future. Learning to adapt to constantly changing situations and multiple crises is becoming more and more important for countries. We, in Greece, understand this better, having been through multiple crises in recent years. And as crises multiply, governments are beginning to question how policies are made and what should be done to address imbalances. So many governments are now experimenting with integrating the concept of systemic innovation into policymaking. And the challenge for policymakers is to coordinate a set of interconnected innovations in key knowledge intensive and rapidly changing sectors of the economy. Sectors such as transportation and communications, information technology, artificial intelligence, and the environment, and to build synergies between policy measures and investments. All this, of course, requires new capabilities, 
a new generation of policies to support competitiveness and employment growth, as well as new models of inclusive governance, bringing together governments, the industry, workers, and the scientific and research community, as we're doing with this event today. And the last point before I close, as we prepare for the future, let us not lose sight of equity. If history has taught us anything, it's that markets cannot succeed in failing societies. The pandemic amplified socioeconomic inequalities. Now we have an opportunity to build a more resilient future, a more inclusive one, a future that takes a big turn for the better. And with this remark, I would like to thank you a lot and to give the floor to Alexander Hedazi, Director of the Global Environment Policy Program and Deputy Director of the International Affairs of the University of Geneva. Thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Mary Lee. Um, it's a great, great pleasure to, to contribute to this, uh, to this exchange, uh, which would have not been possible, obviously, uh, without the, uh, the, uh, the support of Simeon, of uh, Yanis. Uh, Qualco, obviously, uh, has, has been uh, playing an important role to, to jumpstart these, uh, these conversations and the exchanges that are much needed. Mary Lee, you drew out very nicely the the, uh, the, the framework of this discussion and how these elements of change are interplaying from the global level, but also from the national level. And that is why we are here. It's uh, our responsibility to take stock of some of the crises that we've been through. COVID is one of them. And, and nowhere uh, more than Greece, we can take uh, advantage of the wealth of information and data at our disposal. And uh, taking stock of these multiple crises is also important for us to understand that we are beyond bouncing back, as you were saying, to normal. The recovery, the post-COVID recovery that we should be aiming should be long-lasting and encompassing. And the opportunities are ripe now to move uh, towards that goal, uh, also taking stock of the uh, compounding effect of global and national vulnerabilities that we saw during this last set of crises, while capitalizing on national strengths and, uh, and opportunities. Policy prioritization, future policies should be prioritizing future-proof uh, actions. Ecosystems of innovation uh, and innovative thinking, as well as spaces of uh, exchange between policymakers, uh, the industry, the scientific community that you mentioned, should be brought forward and, and uh, amplified. And as such, we can target resilient economies and societies as we would like to see as much as possible, uh, bearing the, uh, the, the burden of uh, uh, dealing with, with response mechanisms, but beyond that, projecting uh, our societies in the future to better absorb some of the upcoming shocks. Uh, towards that, we also need these spaces of exchanges and exchange of practices. And uh, it is my great pleasure to give you the floor, uh, Ambassador, uh, to, uh, to share with us your thoughts on this perspective and the role Switzerland has been playing uh, with, with Greece uh, to expand these exchanges on the practices that we know. Dear Vice President of the Delphi Economic Forum, dear Alexis, um, dear Marily, um, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to participate in this high-level roundtable discussion organized by the Delphi Economic Forum. Thank you for inviting me as a layman among experts. I had the honor of taking part in the annual conference of the Delphi Economic Forum in May of this year. For the first time, a Swiss academic institution, the Albert Hirschmann Center on Democracy of the Graduate Institute of International Studies um, in Geneva, had also been invited to contribute as a partner to the Delphi Forum. It had organized a series of panel discussions and interviews with distinguished economists. 
On today's occasion, I'm very glad that the representative of yet another prestigious institution based in Geneva, namely the World Economic Forum, WEF, has been invited. I'm looking forward to listening to what Mr. Stefan Mergenthaler, Head of Strategic Intelligence, will have to say about the future. It appears further that the next discussion will be moderated by uh, Dr. Alexandre Jazzy from the University of Geneva. La Suisse est à l'honneur. Um, I hope that the Delphi Economic Forum will continue to develop its cooperation with Switzerland in the years to come. As you certainly know, a long-standing friendship prevails between Greece and Switzerland. This year of the bicentennial, we have been celebrating and sometimes rediscovering these connections. I have to mention in this context um, Ioannis Kapodistrias, who contributed to the setup of modern Switzerland in a very significant way, in a way that is, has been almost forgotten in Switzerland. And uh, I'm very happy that the Bicentennial gives us the occasion of discovering and how uh, he contributed in making Switzerland a, a peaceful and prosperous country within its borders and with the status of perpetual neutrality. There were many other philelands. I'd like to mention Anna and Jean-Gabriel Lenard, uh, bankers from Geneva, friends of Capodistrias, who financed um, the Greek Revolution or had contributed financing with their personal fortune. I'll mention Jean, uh, Johann Jakob Meyer, uh, a Swiss from Zurich who ended up in Missolonghi fighting for the freedom alongside the Greeks and printed um, the first paper in Greek language, Elinika Kronika. There are also very uh, modern and contemporary Philelands who continue to this day to build bridges between our two countries. I'm happy to say that the diplomatic relations between Switzerland and Greece are in the best shape in all fields. Currently, our endeavor is to raise the economic ties to a higher level. During Foreign Minister uh, Nikos Dendias' visit to Bern on the 11th of November, um, this topic was discussed. Mr. Dendias gave a detailed briefing on the investment conditions in Greece, where Switzerland ranks already as the fourth investor. Indeed, major Swiss companies but also small and medium-sized enterprises have increased their investments even during the years of the financial crisis. During the years of crisis, financial, migratory, and pandemic-related, Switzerland has reached a sisterly hand to help Greece in a spirit of respect and discretion typical of our humanitarian tradition. I do hope that this cooperation will extend to the topics of the future, like innovation, research, digitalization, big data, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and of course, the green policies. In this context, Switzerland has had some success um, as its international rankish show. Um, there are no secrets to the Swiss model. Actually, there are no sweet secrets left in Switzerland. I can briefly give you some elements as food for thought, uh, but then I will be looking forward to uh, the ensuing presentations and discussions. On research, Switzerland is very competitive. It is among the countries with the highest spending in research and development in relation to its gross domestic product. Um, but this financing comes mostly from the private sector. Over two thirds of the financing is from the private sector. Um, and our institutions are very open to competition uh, and international cooperation. So why our universities have leading rankings? It's not because we Swiss are particularly brainy um, but it's A, because they are very well financed, and B, um, because um, they draw on, uh, on the brain power openly in the world on the basis of a competition. In my institution, I'm from the ETH Zurich, Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, that's where I graduated, over half the teachers are foreigners and also over half the students, and is number six in the rankings in the world. The federal state has a limited role um, in the promotion of research. There's a Research Innovation Promotion Act, which gives some, um, some legal basis and funding, um, which is done through the Swiss National Science Foundation and the Swiss Agency for Innovation Promotion, Inno Suisse. Um, and of course, uh, Switzerland also finances uh, the Federal Institute of Technology domains. The cantons are in charge of the universities and they finance them uh, in a very autonomous way. Um, Switzerland is based on a bottom-up approach and uh, not uh, the other way around. And this is particularly the case in the field of innovation. 
we do not have a written strategy on innovation in Switzerland because we consider that the role of the state is to ensure framework conditions in which then uh, we trust the actors to know better what subjects uh, in research and development they want to focus their work on. Um, Switzerland also relies on a strong tradition of decentralization and liberal economy. So it, we emphasize the autonomy of the players. We don't come and dictate. We don't have five-year plans. We don't um, impose on anyone uh, what field of, of uh, research they should follow. It is not the only model. Uh, Singapore does exactly the contrary and is, has a lot of success. So can we speak of a Swiss model? I would say no. Um, it can be a source of inspiration, it can be a source of cooperation, uh, but not a, a model that can be copied. One of the other characteristics of Switzerland uh, is its economic structure. 99.6% of our economy are small and medium-sized enterprises. So even if you know the big ones, Nestle, Novartis, um, the, the basic uh, structure is SMEs. But one third of these SMEs have national uh, have international exposure, exposures. Um, so companies the size of 100 to 150 um, staff have uh, international dimensions and are active um, all over the world. Actually, Switzerland is a very open country. 24%, 26% of our population is foreigners. And in my canton of origin, in Geneva, over half the population are foreigners. Uh, many other countries would feel in, invaded with such high numbers, but these people contribute to our GDP. There are over 14,000 Greeks in Switzerland, and I'm very proud and happy to say that these people uh, work in high-level jobs. They work as researchers in SAM, they work as teachers, as professors at universities, researchers, um, many doctors. If you fall ill in Switzerland, the chances are you can speak Greek to your doctor in the Swiss hospital. Um, it's a pity, in a way, for uh, the countries who spend so much on educating those people, and then they end up working in Switzerland, but uh, it's our benefit. The Swiss educational system is different from what you might be used to in Greece or in, in some other countries, in the sense that we put an emphasis on um, acquiring professional competences. Uh, a majority of our um, youngsters, um, young women and young women, go into professional training. We have this system of dual education where it's considered if you have a job, if you have a profession uh, and you are competitive on the market, it's better than if you are pushed into academic studies um, where you end up maybe uh, without a job. So um, there's no secret recipe to uh, what Switzerland is doing. Um, but I am certainly looking forward to um, listening to all the ideas that, that will come and I, I wish from the deepest of my heart that Greece would, should have success uh, as it uh, deserves after all those years of crisis. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Justin. It's uh, indeed one of the strengths of Switzerland to, uh, uh, to connect with global circles, uh, global dynamics, and also expertise and, and capacity building uh, opportunities that uh, the world has to offer. Uh, I would like uh, to give the floor to you, Stefan. Uh, it is very important to hear from uh, Stefan Mergenthaler, who's the head of the Strategic Intelligence and member of the Executive Committee of uh, the World Economic Forum, how you foresee these elements of change and how you uh, take stock of the opportunities and capacities that are, are at, uh, at play to better uh, bounce back and, and have a long-lasting recovery. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the uh, warm welcome. Thank you to uh, our hosts at the Delphi Forum, uh, Your Excellency. Thank you for uh, opening this uh, distinguished uh, conversation. It's a real honor and privilege to, uh, to be here. I work for an institution, it was mentioned, the uh, World Economic Forum. And uh, when people hear about the World Economic Forum, people think about the uh, event we uh, organize up in the snowy mountains at the beginning of the year. And uh, I can assure you we're working very hard at uh, bringing it back after a one-year pandemic and paused, uh, pause. 
uh, and I'm greatly looking forward to uh, all things uh, going well, uh, welcoming uh, the Prime Minister, among many other decision makers in uh, Davos at the beginning of the year. Now, our work actually, uh, the foundation of our work, however, are communities, communities that we have nurtured and built for the past 50 years. Uh, we were founded in 1971 and uh, have since built these uh, global networks of uh, leading businesses, government decision makers, academia, civil society, and maybe less well-known networks of young people, young change makers uh, that are organized in hubs in cities all around the world. We have hundreds of those, including in Athens, and I had the privilege of meeting uh, some of them here in the, the audience. Uh, we engage entrepreneurs and leaders of uh, smaller and medium-sized enterprises that want to make a difference on the big issues in the world. We call them the new champions uh, of, uh, of these agendas. And we engage startups and innovators. Uh, and so it's engaging these communities in an ongoing uh, working process of um, work streams and working groups that uh, result in outcomes that are sometimes um, the benchmarking reports were very well uh, known for the benchmarking around competitiveness uh, that we've been doing for uh, decades now, but we also benchmark countries on uh, gender parity, on skills, and many of the important agenda points that Marilee introduced. We do collaborative research on emerging topics, and we build this research into practical tools to help organizations more effectively anticipate trends. And I'll present more of that in the second part of my, my presentation. Uh, but I wanted to give you a sense of, uh, of, of uh, how we work as an organization. We develop policy pilots with governments around the world around emerging areas of emerging technologies, drone, how do we regulate drones, how do we regulate artificial intelligence, how do we regulate uh, emerging science in the medical, biomedical field. We're going to Davos with uh, what I think is uh, the first consideration globally of governance implications of quantum computing. Um, and finally, we of course build coalitions, multi-stakeholder coalitions to address some of the most pressing global issues of our time. And in this regard, I'm particularly pleased that uh, earlier this month, uh, the President of the United States announced in collaboration with the World Economic Forum at uh, COP26 in Glasgow, uh, the first movers coalition, which is a coalition of uh, our partners, uh, leading companies that are committed to uh, creating uh, market opportunities for emerging climate solutions. So just to give you a sense of the way we work, and I personally have been uh, working in this uh, ecosystem for the past decade, uh, and maybe before I jump into uh, the formal presentation, let me uh, give you a short anecdote. Um, because I've, of course, witnessed firsthand the importance of this public-private collaboration, the kind of dialogue uh, that uh, Simeon, Yanis, and colleagues are uh, developing here in Greece. But I've also witnessed the uh, important limitation of decision-making when it comes to the future. And to give you one example, I started uh, out in uh, 2010 one of my first projects uh, at the World Economic Forum was focused on uh, the regulatory environment that would facilitate uh, the adoption of cloud computing. At the time, people generally didn't know what the cloud is. And uh, when we explained it to them, they said, no one is going to uh, abandon on-site storage of their sensitive data. Uh, it's simply not going to happen. Now, of course, those uh, who uh, defied the skeptics are now the titans of uh, industry uh, in, the, in the tech world. A little bit later, I worked on a project on regional integration in the Mediterranean region. And I remember a conversation in uh, Davos uh, 2011 as protests were raging in Tunisia. The CEO of one of the largest uh, Egyptian companies at the time said, with absolute certainty, Egypt is different. It's not going to happen in Egypt. Now, of course, it took less than one week to prove him wrong on this one. And then in 2012, 2013, I was working on a study on the long-term prospects of the Russian economy. 
uh, work that we were presenting at the opening plenary of Davos 2013 to the Russian Prime Minister. And I remember positing to the working group that uh, uh, led up to this uh, presentation in Davos, working group of uh, business leaders, representatives from all major Russian economic institutions, the Central Bank, Finance Ministry, Ministry of the Economy, foreign investors. I posited to consider an oil price of 80 US dollar per barrels. Now at that time, the height of the commodities boom, the oil price was above 120 US dollars. And I can tell you, the representatives were calling me names for daring to propose something so outrageous as a drop to 80 US dollars per barrel. Now, if you follow the oil market, you know that uh, it successively went as far down as the uh, lower 20s. Um, and wh why, so why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because these anecdotes are representative for the foundation of a practice that I've built up at the World Economic Forum since, which we call strategic intelligence, where we help organizations uh, better appreciate the transformative changes that are uh, maybe not in the core of their uh, vision and their business environment in their day-to-day, -day, but will have transformative impact on their work. And so today I intend to share some of this work with you by first exploring, um, by introducing to some of the work we've done in partnership with uh, Google and uh, university in the, in the United States about how to uh, visualize, concretely visualize some of these global changes, work that we've been taking to Davos to help uh, animate the conversations about um, the implications of those changes for organizations. Uh, that'll be the second part of my presentation, drawing also on some of our recent work uh, on digital transformation and building very much on some of the points that Marilee introduced uh, in her introduction. And then finally, I land on practical examples of how we work with organizations on preparing uh, for the future. So let's start. This is, as I said, work we've done in partnership with Google, Carnegie Mellon University in the US, uh, to try to visualize concretely the ways we interact as societies with our planet, understanding the massive urban transformation that is taking place all around the world, but that is probably most visible when you zoom in uh, and look at 40 years of development around the uh, UAE, you see how deeply we have been shaping our physical environment uh, over this period. It's, of course, been the foundation for a lot of the uh, growth and dynamic and innovations we've seen in this, in this period. Uh, most significantly, if we zoom over uh, further east and look at uh, one significant hub of uh, this globalization, the Pearl River Delta in China, uh, and appreciate the, uh, really the, the economic and uh, environmental significance of uh, building these hubs of, uh, of uh, globalization, concentration of population, uh, and appreciating that actually, as part of this trend of urbanization, half the population of Switzerland is migrating to cities every week. It's happening not just in the emerging world, it's happening all around the world. Of course, demographic trends are slightly different depending where you sit in the world, but it's cities in the United States, um, as well as uh, in our part uh, of the world. Again, with differences, of course, in demographics. But we are seeing uh, a predominantly urban uh, population in decades to come, and I think if we think about the implications, let's zoom in again on the nexus, I would say, of globalization with Shanghai, a city today of almost 30 million uh, inhabitants, um, I think representative for the kind of uh, growth dynamics, the globalization we've seen uh, in last decades. And so this data, again, is, uh, nothing new that I'm telling you, but a way of visualizing that data by looking into the past the same technology and the same data can allow us to look also into the future. And so looking at a place like Shanghai, this concentration of wealth and economic activity, looking at it through the lens of rising temperatures to one, two, three, four degrees, and the implication on sea level rise. And I'm personally struck when I show this to uh, audiences in Davos or anywhere around the world, people 
in 2021 are still struck when they see this. I've been learning about uh, sea level rise in primary school, but we're still touched when we see the implications for an urban metropolis like Shanghai of the climate scenarios and pathways we've been discussing very forcefully in a forum like uh, COP just earlier this month. Now think about uh, the repercussions that a short delay at the port of Shanghai uh, because of controls over uh, COVID status of crew had on global supply chains. I think it helps us appreciate that the world interacts in highly complex ways, that developments in one part of the world or in one sector are tightly interconnected to all other parts of society. We cannot talk about supply chains without talking about consumption habits, food, mobility in cities, and so on. But most of the time, we don't look at the world through the lens of the electricity networks, the roads and transportation links, uh, or indeed the uh, internet connectivity that connects us and that forms that interconnectivity of the world. And because of that, we often fail to appreciate the environment in which we operate as an interconnected system that behaves based on the laws of exponentiality and complexity. And that's my key message here that I'm trying to convey, is that the big societal transformations that we're seeing and undergoing and need to undergo in uh, the decade to come are only going to accentuate these laws of exponentiality and complexity. And let me briefly unpack what I mean by that. The one hand, of course, the digital transformation, the exponential growth of emerging technologies that interact with society, with the economy, in fundamentally new ways. We've come, and Yanis has kindly introduced it, we've come to call that the fourth industrial revolution. And with that, of course, the second revolution, if you will, the green transformation, the massive redesign of our economies for sustainability and the complex interconnections and collaborations that requires across sectors and across segments of, of our societies. And those, uh, if we think about exponential dynamics and uh, the fourth industrial revolution, um, I like to uh, refer to this number. I won't try to uh, pronounce the number, but uh, maybe if you see the background, you can imagine what it refers to. It's the number of moves that are possible in the Asian board game Go, uh, much more complex than chess. And uh, for a long period, people said, impossible for machines to uh, understand that complexity and beat uh, human players. Of course, now, uh, almost six years ago, a, uh, an algorithm uh, was able to beat a professional Go player much earlier than many even experts in the field would have anticipated that. Uh, this year, we reached a threshold of over 50 billion connected devices, the Internet of Things in your pocket, on your arm, but also in our industrial facilities that are uh, raising data points and observation about our interactions every second of our, uh, of our life. Again, almost double uh, the amount of uh, uh, what experts would have predicted even uh, two or three years ago. Uh, and then, of course, if we look at just the volume of new emerging science and uh, scientific publications uh, at a scale impossible to digest for any human uh, or uh, team of analysts or researchers. And so this has combined in uh, what we came to call the curve of the fourth industrial revolution, where there's an exponential growth of information and the availability of information, but at the same time, the time value of that information, because developments are actually taking place at such a high pace that information is outdated faster than we can even absorb it. And the time to respond is also decreasing. And so this gap is what we refer to under this term of the uh, curve of the fourth industrial revolution uh, of exponential dynamics, and I think has been very clearly on display uh, these past uh, months of uh, the pandemic and even 
as we speak and uh, try to uncover the behavior of a new variant uh, of the virus. And then, in terms of complexity and the green transformation, needs no explanation in this part of the world. Uh, but if we plot the equivalent, the curve I would call of the green revolution, uh, it's more a cliff than a curve uh, because we have failed uh, for many years to put ourselves on that pathway to 1.5 degrees. If you look at the black line, it's the accumulation of, uh, uh, of collective emissions globally. Um, and where we are today, if we want to keep with a pathway of 1.5 degrees, which, as we saw in the introduction, already has significant implications on our uh, habitat and, and environment, uh, raises a very steep challenge for all of us collectively to uh, integrate in uh, the short period we have uh, to stay on this, on this course. And of course, it's complex also because it requires action. If you look at the contribution of greenhouse gas emissions by sector, you see how transformative across every part, literally every part of the economy, this change has to be. And so it's obvious when we look at those dynamics of these two generational transformations that we, I think, collectively have a responsibility to steer successfully uh, for generations to come. It's clear that we need new ways, new tools of dealing with this environment. In other words, what got us here won't get us there. And if you look at these curves, I think you understand the urgency of that transformation we need to see. Now, at the same time, however, uh, if you look at organizations, most of our organizations still look like this. Neatly compartmentalized areas of responsibility, of expertise, often in a hierarchical structure, right? Following established processes of decision making, of analysis, and uh, decision finding. Whereas the phenomena we are uh, exploring here look a lot more like this. An interconnected living organism, a system where every node interacts with each other and forms emergent complex behavior, behavior that often surprises us as organizations. And so we have come to posit a way of thinking about this environment, a way of making sense or helping organizations monitor this environment through a tool which we've come to call transformation maps that we actively bring into the work we do with organizations. And I'll illustrate this in one moment. I'll just preface it uh, with a few takeaways from research we have done uh, with our community uh, at the onset of the pandemic and trying to understand collectively uh, with many uh, representatives of our uh, biggest strategic partners, uh, large multinational uh, companies, uh, CEOs of uh, tech companies, uh, consulting firms, uh, the real economy, thinking about what role or how organizations need to transform to enable this, what we came somewhat controversially in some areas to call the Great Reset, but uh, uh, in other words, a, a transformative recovery agenda where we try to master these two uh, generational transformations. And I want to share just three takeaways uh, but that are very much driven by this assessment that was shared quite uh, uniformly among the participants there, that several years from now, we will probably no longer talk about digital transformation because non-digital organizations will simply not exist. It's very much framed here around business. I would extend that to any organization, the public sector, uh, civil society, academia included. And so three key implications for organizations um, and I'll try to uh, just uh, uh, illustrate these very briefly because I want to also show you how we bring this into our work. Strategy as a, as a journey. I showed you sort of the schematic way of the organization. I think that rings true to uh, the experience many of us have. And this memo about an annual strategy process, dear leadership team, we're kicking off the uh, strategy process for the coming year, building on the excellent work of the last year. Um, Market analysis due in March, key, key issues in May, 
In the summer, we'll discuss it with the board and establish our five-year plan. Sounds familiar? Right? Established mechanisms. Now, of course, we uh, all appreciate that the real world is messy, fast-changing, uh, strategic uncertainty is a challenge that kind of established uh, planning cycle. And uh, it's also clear from uh, some of the work we've done in surveying executives, uh, great majority of them, 63%, cite slow decision-making uh, as a key barrier for positioning, better positioning uh, organizations in that, in that reset. So what to do about it? Now, of course, easier said than done, but I'll give you some examples how we've done that in, in work with uh, some of our partners. Make strategy a continuous conversation not an annual time-bound process, but a continuous conversation about changes, uh, key, most important, monitoring the most important strategic issues for an organization and build that ability to adjust course as uh, things evolve. And that's, of course, tightly connected and Marley spoke uh, quite elo eloquently to this, more agile structures, uh, more agile structures, uh, akin to some of the structures we see in the software industry um, where uh, traditionally we've seen in traditional organization hierarchical models, expertise isolated in different departments, critical resources are all on premise. We'll need much more cross-functional collaboration, um, agile working flows and integration and collaborations with external expertise. That's where that sort of multi-stakeholder collaboration that is the DNA of our organization uh, comes in uh, but becomes a real operational uh, priority. And of course, all of that requires the uh, mobilization of technology. And with that, again, uh, I could have uh, uh, directly connected that to the uh, introduction Merrily had about talent uh, that requires an augmentation of talent, uh, these digital operating models, uh, will require upskilling at a great uh, scale. Uh, we've estimated uh, in uh, much of our work that some 42% of core skills uh, uh, required to perform jobs are expected to change, and the majority of employees will need some kind of reskilling. So, how do we work and how do we bring that in organizational and on, on that? And it's uh, very practical and concrete. It's a, a capability we've developed and actually made publicly accessible uh, to anyone. We have uh, close to a million active uh, uh, people engaged and working this, with this in businesses, governments, uh, uh, civil society around the world with the aim of helping organizations improve the quality of strategic decision making. Building on this idea that the environment, the strategic operating environment in which we operate, either as a business or a government, has that complex networked nature. And so we try to illustrate that, try to uh, identify on an ongoing basis based on our work with a global community of experts, uh, the most strategic issues in various different topics, industries, and try to help people connect the dots between those. I'll briefly illustrate that. I'll be very uh, short. Uh, it was mentioned we work uh, with organizations around the world. We have uh, a large number of uh, experts, uh, not just from academia, but from business, government, civil society, engaged in this work. And we believe that the diversity of the expertise we can mobilize is a key factor uh, in uh, actually more informed uh, decisions. Uh, we mobilize machine intelligence to complement this, where we scan, and I mentioned the volume of uh, academic publications. Um, uh, we scan on a daily basis over a thousand publications from trusted sources, uh, institutions that we work with uh, that feed into that system. Uh, we do that across uh, hundreds of topics and are continuously adding new topics, that's industries, uh, but also societal issues, urbanization, skills, uh, you name it. And in those areas, we work with our communities of experts to identify what we see as the most important strategic issues that's continuously reviewed with uh, diverse communities. We try to identify 
uh, how these issues connect with other domains. So if we talk about uh, digital work design, as uh, Merrily did in the, the introduction, uh, we need to consider developments uh, around gender parity, digital communications, or developments of uh, the COVID pandemic we uh, explored and then can easily access uh, the same uh, perspectives around those related topics. We feed into that uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, the research and analysis. We scan, um, of course, also uh, all sorts of other material, the uh, uh, visual data that I started uh, this presentation with uh, is also uh, accessible via uh, this work and, and we believe that's very important for complementing the more analytical uh, view on these issues. And we surface trends based on the machine analysis of large volumes of publications, which of these uh, connections are most prevalent at any given time. And so try to help bring that more effectively into organizations. And I mentioned uh, this concept of strategy as a journey in organizations. Now we work with uh, some of our partner companies where we actually help uh, uh, boards or senior leadership teams actually build their own view of the most important strategic issues for their organization and try to establish uh, somewhat of a monitor that can uh, at all times inform uh, the, uh, the organization about uh, uh, important trends that are emerging at the periphery of their domain. And I'm uh, quite pleased actually that we'll even, uh, we're starting to roll this out in uh, collaboration uh, with governmental partners as well. Uh, later this week, we'll actually have uh, um, several ministries in the South African government coincidentally uh, uh, on board their civil servants onto this to, to uh, integrate a more informed policy process. And so I'll end on this. Uh, for, for us, that's one way. Of course, it's a small way, but it's one, one way of helping uh, bringing this mindset shift, this uh, appreciation of uh, uh, a complex and exponentially changing uh, external environment into the core of our organizational discussions. And it's a privilege to have uh, been able to share that with you here. Uh, thank you again for the great hospitality and uh, looking forward to the rest of the conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, without, um, it, it, you, you did highlight the complexity, the complexity of dealing these uh, with these fast forward, ever changing dynamics and uh, coming up with, uh, with the best solutions. And, and one of the elements of uh, response seems to be trust and trust between policy of, and science is what exemplifies the, the panel that I'll, I have the pleasure of uh, moderating. I want to ask to, uh, to the floor, uh, Mr. Alexis Patelis, Chief Economic Advisor to Greece's Prime Minister as well as Professor uh, Nikos Vetas, General Director, Foundation of Economic and Industrial Research, and professors at Athens University of Economy and, and Business. Please join me in the panel. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us for this, uh, this first panel of discussion. Well, we had a very good uh, insight uh, from Merrily uh, on, on the, the, the elements of complexity and response mechanism, uh, the privileged um, spaces of discussion, but also taking stock of best practices that Ambassador uh, of Switzerland uh, uh, highlighted. And also, obviously, Stefan's uh, uh, portraying the, uh, the elements of complexity and these new tools that uh, enable us to come up with agile policies uh, to sustain change and to sustain recovery. Uh, Mr. Fatelis, what is your insight from your uh, point of view as a member of the, uh, the uh, or representative of the uh, policymakers and the state in terms of coming out of the, uh, the multiple sets of crises that Greece has been facing and what we can learn from the experience of Greece? towards that 
lasting uh, recovery and sustainable recovery. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be here. And thank you so much for the organizers for putting this uh, conference together. So I could speak for a very long time. My name is Alex Patos, Chief Economic Advisor. It's a very interesting question you ask. Uh, with, one could start by saying, when, when life gives you lemonade, lemons, you make lemonade. So uh, obviously, it was not in the plan of the government came into power in summer of 2019 to be uh, confronted by a pandemic, or anybody for that matter. Uh, but uh, we quickly adjusted, and essentially, uh, um, there's another saying that says, don't uh, let a good crisis go to waste. So um, we uh, took advantage, <coughs> excuse me, of, of uh, what the pandemic uh, offered to us in terms of adjusting policy and, of course, responded to the challenges of the pandemic. I, I'm going to focus exclusively on the economic side of things, setting aside the health aspect because it's not my area of focus, and I strongly believe we should not all speak about all subjects. But um, on economics, the government was elected on a platform of three pillars, uh, reforms, shifting the fiscal mix, and dealing with the legacy banking issues. And I would say that, broadly speaking, the, we continued along, across those three uh, themes despite the pandemic. So, for example, on reforms, the government has already passed over 220 bills through parliament. And I would say one lesson is uh, you never know how long something might last. The pandemic has ended up lasting two years. If the government had been paralyzed for two years, if it only was focusing on the pandemic, it would have been a real shame. So uh, you do have to uh, tackle other issues too. And uh, we have passed many reforms uh, through parliament, many important reforms this year, for example, uh, labor market reform, uh, reform of the, uh, of the um, uh, supplementary pension system, uh, application of the insolvency reform, et cetera, et cetera. On the fiscal side, the pandemic uh, changed the rules and effectively um, uh, many of the rules were suspended. Now here you have a temptation, obviously, to use that opportunity to waste money. And so the lesson that you have to draw is that you need to be careful, use the opportunity wisely. Uh, so other than the standard measures of support that a government had to do or, or chose to do during the pandemic, supporting uh, employment and, uh, and uh, businesses, and I can talk about this in a, in a while, um, you also uh, need to uh, have a good quality of spending. I would say that my, my own opinion is that too, people have focused too much on the number, the fiscal support, percent of GDP, and not enough on the quality of support. Uh, and I think we're seeing some of this now with the way, for example, inflation patterns have differed around the world. Um, I think in general, Europe has done much more targeted programs that have uh, resulted in a, in a better mix. In Greece, we used the opportunity to pass some of our structural uh, views to lower taxation on salaried employment, uh, social security contributions by four points, and uh, uh, eliminating the solidarity income tax surcharge, and of course, um, lowering the corporate income tax rate as well to 22% now and a number of other things. These are structural tax cuts that, to answer your question, will also help uh, get out of the pandemic because obviously lowering taxes of sal on salaried employment um, doesn't do much if you're in a lockdown. But as you exit and the demand um, uh, for labor comes along, then obviously uh, it's going to be strengthened and the experience tells us that there's going to be uh, mul uh, multiplier effects uh, throughout time. Now, if you look at what's happened to uh, employment and unemployment in Greece, it's very encouraging. Unemployment has fallen to 13%, the largest drop in the euro area, and 180,000 jobs have been created uh, this year alone. So we do think that some of these structural stuff um, has worked. Um, to follow along those lines, uh, deposits in Greece have also increased by over 30 billion. So, in fact, deposits for non-financial corporations stand at, the, at a record level. So there is a fuel there to sustain the recovery uh, going forward. But um, I've taken up five minutes already, so I'm going to end my initial remarks with what I would say is the most important uh, legacy of the pandemic and one that is probably uh, the biggest lesson, which is that the pandemic having, and I'm talking about the economics here, the pandemic having been a symmetric shock across all the countries, um, the quality uh, uh, of, of government response did matter, and the image of the countries uh, was, um, 
was affected. And so for Greece, it was a unique opportunity, a country having come through crises, as you mentioned, at the beginning of the pandemic, many thought that the country would fail in the um, uh, health uh, management of the crisis, and also there were predictions that there would be the sharpest uh, decline in GDP, um, based primarily on views about tourism. That did not happen. GDP in Greece uh, in the second quarter already exceeded the pre-pandemic levels of Q4 2019, and we're going to get the third quarter GDP number in uh, on the 6th of December. So really the most important uh, lasting legacy of the pandemic for Greece and the one that gives us the most optimism for the future is simply that it managed to change the image of the country and to break from the pattern that this is a crisis country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Petelis. Uh, it is indeed a very interesting uh, experience uh, from outside, from global spheres and uh, uh, global uh, uh, spaces of governance, uh, like where I'm coming from, Geneva, to see that uh, Greece has been successful in, in setting up the standards and, and its uh, long-term uh, strategies while dealing with a short-term crisis. Uh, Professor Retas, what is your insight on that and how, how Greece uh, experienced out of this uh, last set of crises uh, can uh, uh, show us uh, some of the elements of success that has been set out? Alex covered a lot of what is to be said on the topic. Um, so, so what is the question? The question is, the, the real question is, is Greece coming out of this second crisis stronger uh, than it got into it? And this refers to how the pandemic crisis was um, managed, but also on whether we can change the long-term trends of the Greek economy. Uh, let's think about these long-term trends. Uh, due to lagging productivity, low labor force participation, and an adverse demographic, most studies find that the Greek economy in the long run, in the pre-crisis world, in the pre-COVID world, was about to grow by about 1% real per year. And this is insufficient for many reasons, um, including handling existing debt, um, making Greece converge with the core of the Eurozone um, and effectively gets out of everybody's mind the doubt that Greece may get into trouble to finance itself again. There is a number of things to be said about changing this long-term trend. One is access to finance. In the short run, the, and by, by short run, let, let us say somewhere between the next two to five years. Unless um, we have unforeseen contingencies in Europe, <clears throat> financing the Greek economy will not be an issue. And if you couple this with the fact that there is um, an unused employment um, pool and there is an investment gap, then this by itself is about to raise the growth rate of the Greek economy. Um, our estimates at UOV are that Greece is going to grow very fast, um, already is growing this year, more than what the government estimates, probably more than 8% real. Next year, this will stay at about 8, 4, 4%. Gradually, this is going to converge lower. It cannot stay there forever. Um, but thinking about the next four or five years, this can be high growth rate times. The question is, during these times, <clears throat> are you preparing a steady growth in the, in the longer run? Um, and then the question is, two things. Are you changing the country enough so that the financing can keep flowing in? And B, the infamous structural reforms. Um, so that's where our focus, I think, um, uh, should be. And there is one third issue, which is an asterisk, but a big asterisk, which is that COVID, in addition to a deep healthcare crisis, was also a crisis that is changing the way economies function around the world. And um, I guess following that motto, don't let a crisis go um, wasted, uh, 
um, if you are in a bad position and things change and you start playing musical chairs, then you can find a better position. If you act fast and decisively. So, um, living, if, if, if Greece operates only on the expectation that access to finance, and when I'm saying access to finance, I mean RRF and the other EU funds, um, plus what we have access to thanks to the monetary and fiscal rules in Europe that have been very close to extremely unconventional territory. Thanks to that, Greece is not in trouble to finance itself today and for the next couple of years. But if we think that this is enough, that in my view is going to be a fatal mistake because the long-term trends are going to be, to prove to be much stronger than this short-run uh, recovery. And you can actually easily see uh, a Greece that can grow and then very fast is going to start flirting with uh, crisis again. And that's where policy comes in. Policy has to shift Greece's production function to something different from what it is today. Of course, this is easier to say than to do, but it's all about incentives. Um, Alex already mentioned some directions in the, um, in, in, in the tax system. I would absolutely agree that the shift towards lowering the burden on salaried um, work is, uh, is of paramount importance and should continue taking uh, priority. There is a number of other uh, such positive reforms that were mentioned before some that were not mentioned. But in my view, and just to not to overuse your time, there are fair four necessary steps so that we can say that Greece is out of the woods. And in some sense, we have covered only two. Step one, get access to finance now. This we have. It wasn't obvious. If you go back to um, March of when COVID hit. It wasn't obvious that Europe would act. It wasn't obvious that Greece would benefit from this act. And it wasn't obvious that the markets would actually buy the story. But num step number one, done. Step number two, the government showing a pro-reform agenda. We can have a very long discussion, and there will be issues with which I will disagree with Alex. But you can also check that box as well. Overall, this government um, says it is a reformist government, and it does reforms. Okay? There are two more steps, however, that um, remain. One step has to do with cracking some of the hard nuts when it comes to reforms the functioning of public administration. Yes, we have introduced digital technology that is bypassing a lot of the bottlenecks, but the effective structure of public administration so that we gradually build a state that is going to, in, to operate independent of the government, strengthening independent authorities, the balance between Athens and the peripheries, all this is, is work that remains uh, to be done. And the reason that this is important is because every investor, and we do need investors in this country, with uh, emphasis on long-term investors. These investors do not care how the country is this year or next year. They have a long-term um, long view. So, so, the, so the third step that is still there it also has to do with the speed of the justice system, hmm? is the government has to demonstrate um, not only will, but effectiveness in cracking some of these hard nuts. And this will shift the discussion to a different equilibrium. Last, in addition to demonstrated effective policy from the government in, the, in such areas, 
there is the issue of motivating broader forces. Um, public sector doesn't just mean government. Um, there are, um, everyone in this room, hmm? everyone has to be motivated um, so that, because, because the work of pushing Greece on a different path five years from now is, is certainly feasible, hmm? but it's, it's not uh, done yet. And, and you do need this bridge between today's beneficial and, uh, and, 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 and positive policies into how Greece is going to be five years from now. You uh, very rightly so mentioned, uh, Professor, Professor Retos, the uh, importance of this equilibrium that we are all desiring. And again, coming from Switzerland and in front of uh, the representative of Switzerland, uh, the mea culpa uh, moment of the Swiss government was when we were told at some point within this, uh, the first set of uh, COVID, cycle of COVID, that uh, obviously it was a pandemic, a uh, public health crisis, but also an economic and a social one we didn't foresee in the beginning that came later and then we had to set up in Switzerland a series of policies and measures. The equilibrium is, is difficult to reach when you don't take into account the volatility uh, of uh, global trends. We uh, heard from Mary Lee earlier on the great resignation, which is the volatility of the labor market. We heard from Stefan uh, earlier on also about the, the volatility of the commodities uh, prices. How do you deal with these elements of uncertainty when it comes uh, from, obviously, from the global, uh, the global dynamics of change uh, to make sure that what it has been uh, engaged here in Greece is not going to be altered or, uh, or diverged? Thank you very much. Uh, this country, I guess, is well experienced uh, with volatility and uh, um, uh, unexpected events. Uh, you can hear the audience laughing, but you know, when COVID hit, obviously this was a moment of difficulty for everybody, but for the Greeks, it was, uh, it was also a moment where they said, you know, not again, like we have been through so much and we're gonna go through some more. And actually, if you look at what happened, we didn't really see uh, a lot of bankruptcies um, in the country, obviously partly that was, largely that was due to government support, but it was also because the crisis had, um, the, the, sorry, the, the, the companies that had survived the 10-year crisis were very strong companies, and they still uh, remain so. Um, the trends that you mentioned are very interesting, and uh, we see them in Greece as well, uh, upheaval in the labor market. For example, this year, you will, you will see a much greater number of people who quit their jobs as opposed to being laid off, so voluntary uh, changes in employment. And as you mentioned, commodity prices, today we got uh, the inflation print uh, was uh, a, a new high for the euro area. Greece luckily has the sixth lowest uh, inflation in the euro area, but still obviously um, too high for a lot of people. But a government cannot control global trends. You have to take them as a given, particularly a small a country like Greece. But what you can do is strengthen the resilience of the economy to ensure that, uh, that shocks that hit it um, can be absorbed. So uh, following up from Professor Vedas' comments before, uh, in 2020 and 21, we had, let's say, global capital rainfall, and when, when it rains, when you don't, uh, when it rains money, you don't want to hold an umbrella. In 21, uh, Preuss Bank raised 1.4 billion euro, Alpha Bank 0 0.8 billion, uh, PPC, the electricity company, completed a 1.4 billion capital increase. All of these capital increases strengthen the capital base of the bank and of the electricity company and therefore make them more resilient to future shocks. And if you look at one of the reasons behind the upgrades that we saw in 21 uh, was precisely that, that the banking system was strengthened and we expect more upgrades next year. Um, similarly, the picture that I described in the labor market, one of strength, um, is important because ultimately uh, when you're unemployed, you don't have any of your own income, you depend on benefits, and you are obviously at a disadvantage when hit by the shock of uh, the inflation and energy in price increases. So the fact that uh, if, you, if you as a government can create the foundation for a stronger labor market, whether it's through taxation or through reforms, then obviously that's the best way uh, that you can deal with these global shocks. Having said that, um, you also have to adjust your policy and not be too dogmatic 
when shocks uh, come along. So, for example, uh, the energy price shock has been much larger than what anybody would have expected, and in response, the government has uh, put together a package of supporting the vulnerable households. Um, how exactly you put it together and what exactly you mean by vulnerable is a, is a separate conversation, but obviously you adjust and you increase that package. And I should say that there is a case to be made that there needs to, and I'm not just talking about Greece, I'm talking about globally, since we want to have global implication, that you do need to have a much more uh, well thought out framework of how to deal with uh, protecting more vulnerable uh, households and businesses as we transition through uh, climate change. Uh, uh, we, like other countries, uh, are receiving an increased share of revenues from the ETS trading. ETS will eventually expand to include uh, buildings and transport. Um, and so the monies that governments will be receiving from these, um, from these rights will increase substantially over time. And not enough thought, in my opinion, has been put into how exactly that money should be spent. And obviously it should be spent in a way that, um, that uh, protects the objectives of climate change, meaning that we want to make sure that we don't get, uh, uh, that, we, that the more vulnerable are protected and we don't have a backlash of popular opinion. But that needs to be done in a more um, consistent and thought out uh, framework. And I, I expect that one of the legacies of this energy crisis will be that it'll force a lot of governments around the world to think more thoughtfully as to how to deal with this issue uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fatalis. And it's very important to, uh, once again, to take stock of this uh, set of crises uh, to move towards uh, what is a long-term uh, crisis, which is climate change. And there is no recipe, as we all know, to, to address it uh, in a short term. Uh, the, uh, the importance of vulnerabilities and identifying vulnerabilities cannot be dismissed. And the compounding effect of global vulnerabilities and local vulnerabilities is also very important. Rightly so, you mentioned the, uh, uh, the, uh, these elements of risks that uh, affect the vulnerable groups within our societies, but also the market further down the road. Professor Vatas, what is your uh, opinion and insight on how to, uh, to protect ourselves? from these uh, domino effects. Uh, subsidies, are they uh, a way forward? Uh, incentives uh, like subsidies or you know, tax, uh, or fix, uh, fiscal or tax uh, policies? What do you think is the, is the best way forward to, uh, to reduce as much as po possible this uh, compounding effect and you know, growing uh, vulnerabilities in face of this crisis? You, you mean for, for labor? Yes. I, look, the, 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 the global economy, but also Greece, is coming out of uh, the, the current crisis with at least two areas where you have to be very careful. One is um, debt, uh, traditional debt. And then the, the other question is how human capital is going to interact with technology and how you can find your niche in the global um, allocation of, of work. Um, for that, there is, a, there, are, there is a long list of positive things that you can say. And then there is a couple of things for which you have to be very careful. Um, on, on the positive side uh, of things, um, the pandemic, first of all, uh, brought several years back, f several years forward, the, the idea that you can live somewhere and work somewhere else in some sense, right? I mean, you can sell your services somewhere else. Um, to the extent that Greece continues to be a safe um, and not extremely expensive place to live, but it does strengthen its infrastructure when it comes to schools, healthcare, and so on and so forth, um, it can, in, it, it, it can um, utilize its position, its central position in the Eastern Mediterranean and become a hub in a way that we haven't done the last several decades. Greece can be really a very attractive place uh, for everyone from, from, from the Balkans, Turkey, Israel, Cyprus, of course, North Africa, and of course for many others uh, that would come here to study from classics to technology. We have almost zero of that today. We are only starting scratching the surface of this 
Um, and I can think of very few countries that grew fast without attracting people through their um, higher education research and then applying the research uh, um, combination. So f in, in that sense, uh, the sky is the limit in that regard. That's one. The second thing is that there are parts of the Greek labor market um, that, that are suffering from, um, from, from bad rules, I'm going to call them in general. Uh, th this refers to the, l to the low labor force participation um, for, for women, in particular mothers. So policies that are going to help them better incorporate into the labor force are going to be key. It's, and it's not just a matter of economics, but also of social uh, priority. Incorporating young people easier into the, the, the labor market. We were not doing a very good job uh, at that. Um, having a more active and effective immigration policy. We have to be attracting people uh, over the long run or, or, or the short run. So these are matters that, for which the state can actually um, uh, do great things. But eventually, unless you also move technology so that technology can be generated here, um, many of the good brains will not stay in the country. So it has to do with also shifting your production so that uh, while um, doing more and better in terms of tourism and transport and all of these things, you also connect better technology with manufacturing. All these are positive things. Uh, the thing that worries is that during the crisis, the current crisis, at the same time that these opportunities emerged, we also saw um, an extremely strong, necessarily strong, role of the state. In a country where we have a tradition to turn to the state for pretty much everything. Subsidies, um, wage increases through regulation, and so on and so forth. So it's going to be a tricky balance how you release the, the, the potential of the Greek economy and in some sense um, gradually stop this reliance on, um, on, on state subsidies and so on and so forth at a time when we also have to tighten uh, fiscally. You very um, nicely positioned also uh, geopolitically uh, Greece uh, on the European map and Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, it is very important to understand where you both foresee future of Greece in terms of the big leapfrog, which is sustainability trends. Uh, this crisis showed us that, again, a crisis can be multi multifaceted. Nevertheless, by entering one point, you can affect other points. And you know, uh, climate uh, negotiations and uh, climate uh, uh, summit in, in Glasgow showed us that you know, they're, they're long trends in, in terms of, uh, of measures and, and policies towards uh, carbon emissions. The same thing for, for social issues, the same thing for the question of equity and gender balance. How do you think that we can improve policy? Uh, also based on what was discussed earlier on, which is trust among different stakeholders, policy and policy formulators, the industry, but also science. What is your, uh, your insight on, on policy and you know, how to improve it? Um, this government was elected very much um, on a platform of evidence-based evidence policy, meaning that uh, you need to study the facts and come up with a conclusion. The Prime Minister, uh, myself for example, I come from the private sector, the Prime Minister has always reaches out to specialists in various subjects and um, uh, seeks their advice and listens to it, and this is probably uh, a good way to do policy. Uh, but um, I think you also have to be open-minded and flexible um, and not ideological. So, for example, in response to your comment earlier about um, foreign policy and climate change, uh, foreign policy, again, is not one of my subjects, but, for example, the country now has signed uh, MOU with Egypt to develop uh, uh, 
uh, a connection between the two countries to transport uh, fuel and renewable energy in the future. There were discussions with Saudi Arabia as well, when and if Saudi Arabia develops uh, hydrogen to be able to, to transport it into Europe through Greece. Uh, PPC, part of its capital increase plan, um, included uh, plans to uh, acquire um, plants and companies in the Balkans and in the Central and Eastern Europe. All of this has an economic dimension to it, but also has a security dimension to it in the sense that you improve your, you increase your interconnectivity and therefore you reduce the fluctuations that you're likely to get uh, on energy prices. So that's an example of foreign policy uh, tying into uh, economic policy um, and effectively diversification. Um, and uh, I think the same can be said um, about um, a lot of aspects uh, of policy. Professor Vetas also mentioned, I wanna briefly touch upon what he said about the opportunities from the pandemic. You know, what, it, what is the comparative advantage that this country has? Um, as the Prime Minister has often said, uh, it's at least threefold. It's the geography, the fact that, and it, it ties to your question, the fact that we are located where we are, uh, in the southeast of Europe uh, and the Mediterranean, but also the natural beauty um, of our country, uh, blessed with uh, sun, sea, uh, mountains and beaches. And this obviously creates a unique opportunity in this new post-pandemic environment where we can, some of us can pick where we live. If we create the good digital infrastructure and we create the right tax system, we have uh, started a digital nomad visa program, then we can attract uh, not just digital nomads, but people who are looking maybe to relocate and base their, uh, their work uh, elsewhere. And there are multinationals that are currently planning uh, to give a lot more freedom to their employees in 22 and, and, and onwards to allow them to live in different countries and work from there. And for a country of 11 million people, this is a, a, a very good opportunity. Um, the other big advantage we have, obviously, um, is uh, the labor market, our labor. We have uh, well-educated, a strong middle class, but also the diaspora, 500,000 Greeks who left during the crisis, and a lot of people willing to return if the right uh, jobs come along. And this is a comparative advantage of a country that went through a crisis and therefore does not have the tightness of the labor market that other countries might have, and this is uh, another unique selling point we have. And bizarrely, and I say bizarrely because it might, might come as a, uh, as a surprise to many, not only um, is Greece no longer a risky country, but I would argue that one of the advantage, advantages we carry is political stability. We, uh, the electoral system and the way that the voting works today uh, has uh, produced a, a single party majority government in parliament, which is uh, no longer the case in the majority of European uh, countries. And this uh, creates a stability, plus the experience, the fact that Greece withstood one of the biggest shocks that uh, have ever been produced in economic history outside wars, the fact that it withstood that and came out stronger um, gives a lot of confidence to somebody that it will be able to withstand other shocks such as COVID or whatever else uh, may come in the future. So uh, in response to your question, you definitely need to have policy, uh, sorry, uh, evidence-based policy uh, and, and listen to people who have studied su uh, subjects, but also I think you need to be flexible in your thinking, not too ideological, and uh, learn to adjust uh, to, to what things, uh, how things unfold. For example, as Professor Vetas mentioned, one of the legacies of the COVID crisis will be that a lot of people now understand better the role uh, that a government has to play and the role of the state. And uh, uh, countries that do not have uh, states that are well organized or, or strong have not been able to deal with the pandemic as much. And of course, the health system uh, always, um, um, it's important to have a strong health system. So these kinds of uh, lessons will also follow us uh, through COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, from political stability, which is indeed very much needed to, uh, to sustain change, um, to what we heard earlier on from the, uh, the Swiss ambassador in terms of the importance of research. Uh, to, to empower policy through research. Professor Vatas, what is your insight on the trust and the and working that we need to set up between uh, research, scientific community, and policy to help each other improve the models that we have? I think, I think this all um, falls under the same uh, chapter, which is how you can strengthen uh, long-term 
stability and institutions in the country. Um, re research um, will not come by itself. It, research is embodied in, at top researchers. You need some top researchers that will decide to live here rather than in Switzerland or Germany or, or Singapore or, or Silicon Valley. And that, um, th there will be some left in Switzerland as well, don't worry. Not, <laughs> not, not, not everybody's going to come here. Um, but um, th th that is not trivial. It requires also um, a system that treats intellectual property rights in a certain, in a very effective manner. There are also economies of scale. There is a minimum scale that is, the, that is required so that you decide to take your family and move somewhere else because you, just, you don't move somewhere just because there is an excellent job there. You move somewhere because there may be an excellent job, but in case you decide to move to, to, to another job, there are also other jobs. So um, there is a threshold effect. We need to do enough so that then it gets a dynamic. That, that's why research is done in clusters around the world. Mm -hmm. Now, th there is, at the same time, there is an opposite dynamic, which is that thanks to the fact that we are now so much connected, you don't have to spend your whole career in one place. And um, for instance, if you take medicine or clinical trials or whatever, by design, there, it has to locate a different location around the world. And we haven't actually um, conquered our, our place there. So um, if, if you actually want to be even more melodramatic and you try to think where incomes are going to come from in over the next decades, mm -hmm. and you take seriously the idea that artificial intelligence and everything around it is going to replace a lot of the jobs that we now have, um, this means that there will, be an, an, there will be areas where good jobs, jobs anyway, will be created. Mm -hmm. This has to do with all the, how we call it, the care economy, you know, for the elderly, the young, the vulnerable. That, that's a big category of things and related also with the medical professions. Um, but another big area has to do with uh, research and high tech. Mm -hmm. And for that, everything that we discussed um, is, is, is going to be uh, very important. Um, I, I want to, um, since I see from the clock there that our time is, is, is running up, th there is a couple of quick thoughts about um, what um, Alex, Mr. Patel, is said. There are things, you know, the, the current crisis worked as a, as, as a laboratory of ideas as well. Uh, one of the things that we learned is that, um, or, or I don't know if we learned, but we have to think about is exactly the role of the state. The role of the state is not neutral. Um, certainly, a large state doesn't necessarily mean it's effective. We saw countries around the world with small states, but because they could move and decide, and they were based on, on facts rather than uh, wishful thinking, they were very effective, okay? So you do need a state, but a state with characteristics that in my view are different from what our current state has. Um, and the interaction with the state and the businesses is two-way. If most of your businesses are inward looking, then they will make the state, their, their image, look like their image and vice versa. So moving indeed to a different equilibrium with more extrovert uh, businesses will also demand a more effective state. One last word about uh, the healthcare system. Because people will not move to this country either temporarily or permanently unless they have good access um, to healthcare. Our healthcare system is, is open, but is not very effective. And it doesn't demand only more money. It's a matter of its architecture. In particular, and that's a very long discussion, is not well connected with technology. And the fact that you don't have, even though at pockets, for instance, we have um, uh, e-prescriptions and every prescription of drugs in this country, much more than in other countries, we, we, we have a, a perfect, a great record of, the, of these things. We don't use uh, this uh, wealth of data that we have 
so that we can uh, create incentives for, for the doctors. Um, we help uh, patients move more easily from one to the other. That's another area where if we make progress there, that's going to help both um, the, the way we here in Greece now live, attract people, but also in, in, um, attract more research. Um, unfortunately, the time is uh, ripe. We have to leave for uh, the next uh, panel. I just want to, uh, to conclude on this very last element that you mentioned. Uh, research is important, policy is depending on research and vice versa. And therefore, we would need to come with new data ecosystem. The data and the data at our disposal is going to be tremendously important in terms of making policy more agile, more effective. Uh, and, and this is something that we hope that uh, in the upcoming period uh, we can exchange on uh, based on our experience in Switzerland and beyond at the global level and what is happening here in Greece. I would like to uh, 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 thank you, uh, both panelists. Please join me to applaud uh, both panelists for a fantastic uh, discussion. Thank you.